responsible and socially inclusive policies to address the challenges our country and district face. He also believes representation begins with listening, which is why he's been driving the district in his 1960 International Harvester campaign truck, sharing coffee and having conversations with people across the political spectrum. Based in part on those conversations, here are some of his top priorities. Campaign finance reform, universal health care, a stronger economy, and a cleaner environment. I'd like to introduce candidate Dean Phillips. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. I, um, I got to tell you, for whatever reason brought you here tonight, um, I'm great. Uh, you know, participation uh, is, is the key to a successful democracy. And in a country in which I believe about 45% uh, of our registered voters didn't choose to vote in the last election, uh, it's very heartwarming. Um, uh, and I'm grateful for the fact that you are all out a year before, well, there's actually an election tomorrow, um, uh, but a year out from our next election. And I've said to many, I would, I'd rather lose this race with 90% turnout than win it with 40. And that's why I'm so grateful to all of you. I want to salute you, Jamie, for coming all the way from St. Paul. Uh, Jamie's a, a, a senior right, at St. Paul Academy doing a school project on campaign finance reform. And since we're at a church, I will preach the gospel about campaign finance reform, as I've said before. Um, so I'm going to make some brief remarks just for those of you who don't know me, to tell you a little about my background uh, and why I'm here and why I'm doing this. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, because the spirit of my campaign is to listen, I want to hear from all of you. Uh, I want you to challenge me, I want to hear what's on your mind, uh, I want to know what's troubling you, and equally, I want to hear your ideas, uh, because that is ultimately the first responsibility of representation, is to listen. So my story uh, begins in 1969, I was born uh, in St. Paul, and uh, when I was six months old, my birth father, Father Artie Peffer, was killed in the Vietnam War. Uh, he had gone to the University of Minnesota on an ROTC scholarship, uh, because he lacked the resources to attend school uh, and served our country and was killed in Clay Coup uh, in July when I was six months old. Uh, my mother was 24 and, and widowed, and we moved in with my great-grandparents uh, in St. Paul for the first two and a half years of my life. Uh, when I was about three, in a stroke of an extraordinary good fortune, my mother remarried Eddie Phillips, uh, who was a remarkable father who adopted me and brought me into a family of, of extraordinary blessings, uh, of, of achievement, and success, and philanthropy, uh, and wonderful principles. And I say to many, I know this fine line between advantage and disadvantage. Uh, I grew up as a little boy visiting one grandmother in a beautiful home in California, and another in public housing in St. Paul. And that same little boy uh, was deeply troubled by the fact that in his own family, uh, there was such iniquity. And uh, as, a, as a man, I'd like to say young man, <laughs> as a man now, I'm even more troubled by it. And in no small part, uh, that's why I am doing this. Uh, it is the responsibility of those who have been blessed with good fortune to share that as, with as many people as humanly possible uh, and afford opportunity uh, to everybody. I do believe that is a moral imperative as an American to share opportunity with everybody. It does not ensure that we will have the same outcomes for everybody, but I do believe we can provide the same opportunity to all. Uh, and that's a little about my background. I grew up in Edina. I, after my uh, dad adopted me, we moved to Edina. I went to Edina Highland School as a little kid. Grew up playing hockey and baseball at Walnut Ridge Park. Uh, I'm the product of both public education as a young, young boy and also private education. Uh, and then I went to college at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and came back to the University of Minnesota uh, for my master's in business. And as some of you know, uh, my family's uh, businesses uh, have included uh, the beverage business, uh, more recently the ice cream business, and now the coffee business. So I invite any of you who want a nice cup of cocoa or coffee to come down to Penny's in downtown Minneapolis or Linden Hills, and I would be happy to clean your plates, because that is the only qualification I have to work at a coffee shop. <laughs> but I'm, pr I'm proud of our coffee shop, because we pay a livable wage. Everybody at Penny's makes $15 an hour, uh, and then receives tips and um, a nice livable wage, uh, which I believe is important. And it's not a mandate, of course, it's not legislated, but I believe it's a principle uh, that we're trying to reflect in doing good uh, and rising the tide for all the votes, if you will. So, so why am I doing this? Uh, when I woke up after the last election, uh, I was dismayed. I was shocked. 
uh, I was somewhat appalled, uh, and I thought, rather than complain, uh, I should participate. Because in, in a democracy like ours, in a country like this, uh, it is an imperative uh, to participate, as all of you are doing as well. And it wasn't just the fact that Donald Trump was elected, uh, it was the fact that the tenor and tone of the campaign uh, that led to his ascendancy uh, was appalling. I'm the father of a 19-year-old and 17-year-old daughter, uh, and to sit and watch them, watch the television uh, with him, say the things that he said, do the things that he did, um, saddened me more than anything else. Uh, I'm someone who grew up celebrating um, presidents from both parties and recognizing that sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but if there's a thread that connects all of us, it was principles and, and values. Uh, and we all want the same ends. We may see things differently relative to means, uh, but I saw this uh, president as an entirely different, unanticipated, um, and never seen before event in our history. So when I started to assess how to participate, um, I started looking at Eric Paulson's record. And I found him to be uh, a man who, of course, is a career politician. Uh, but I found him to be someone who uh, started his tenure in office um, as a little bit more of the moderate that he likes to portray himself as. But he's also someone who has migrated so distinctly, so distinctly across the spectrum to the right, uh, that that is no longer true. You know, he, in my estimation, now woefully misrepresents himself and even more represent, misrepresents our district. Uh, but it was his vote on the AHCA, the health care bill, that you all probably remember, that troubled me more than anything and indicated uh, in very stark terms um, that his principles had fully migrated from moderate uh, in principle to being beholden to a party that simply wanted to get something done to earn the votes of their voters. And I thought this was the chance, this is the time, this is the place to participate. And I've said to many that our Constitution anticipated a president like Donald Trump. But our Constitution did not anticipate a Congress filled with so many who lack courage. And Eric Paulson, in my estimation, is the poster child for that lack of courage. Not willing to stand up when it begs for it, not willing to speak truth to power. And what, you know, I've, I've been tweeting on occasion about uh, saluting Bob Corker and John McCain, you know, and Jeff Flake, you know, men who have shown a little bit of courage speaking truth to their own party, but it shouldn't take brain cancer and the retirement from the Senate to do so. You know? And there are other Republican members of Congress, uh, Susan Collins, for example, who I salute, because she is um, staying in the Senate and is also speaking truth to that power, which I salute. But we need more people that do that. And as I've driven around this district over the last five or six months in my little 1960 truck and listened to people and, and, and understand, when I say I listen to people, I listen to everybody. My truck doesn't say I'm a Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or anything in between. It's just the government repair truck. And my grand intention is to do just that. You know, the, the word repair is exactly what I'm doing. I want to bring people back together, repair them, repair our politics and repair this country by listening and having conversations with people. And as I've done so, I've discovered that the fundamental challenge that we face and has to be addressed before anything else can be achieved is campaign finance reform. In my estimation, uh, the way we have allowed money to corrupt our system and to corrupt our elected officials, to, to corrupt Congress, uh, is, is sad, uh, certainly preventable, uh, and also addressable. We can fix this. But when you afford, when you have a cap of $5,400 per person in a congressional race like this. Each one of you could write a check for $5,400 today uh, to me or any candidate for Congress. Uh, and by the way, I'm not asking for that. But $5,400, where do you think politicians spend their time? They spend their time seeking those checks. And not just from individuals like you and me, but from PACs and from lobbyists and from all the people that spend all their time and all their treasure trying to influence those in Washington, D.C., you know, to the tune of billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And we wonder, we wonder why certain members of Congress take votes that we cannot understand. Why well, I, I ask you to do one thing when you go home tonight. Go to Open Secrets online and just look at where the money comes from. 
Just look. Look at where Paulson's money comes from. And you will be staggered. And you will be appalled, as I have been. And in my estimation, because politicians spend all their time seeking money and contributions from the wealthy individuals in communities and from corporations and PACs and lobbyists and special interests, they don't spend their time speaking to normal people. They're too busy. But it's not just a matter of money. It's a matter of that time. It is a matter of all the time that they are spending seeking that money. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is representing us. They're not spending the time doing that. And I say this regularly. You know, that, that's what's the most troublesome to me. When you've got a, if you're, if you're a member of Congress, you have to walk across the street from Capitol Hill and go to a, a little conference room, because you can't fundraise from your office, and most members of Congress spend hours a day, some two, some three, some four hours a day, on the phone dialing four dollars. I don't know many jobs that I've ever known where you could spend half your time doing something that has nothing to do with the job that you're hired to do and maintain your position. And I don't think members of Congress should be afforded any more slack than any member of any business or any school or any enterprise to which you have a responsibility. And it's troublesome to me. What troubles me more is that there are only six members of Congress right now, six, who don't accept money from PACs and lobbyists and special interests. Uh, I'm going to be the lucky number seven. I'm not taking money from these people because I want to go to Congress and represent my own principles and all of you. That is the fundamental role of representation. It is not to represent those who can finance you the most or to whom you are beholden to maintain your role and your position. I don't want a career out of this. And I don't think that's what our, our founding mothers and founding fathers wanted this to be either. Uh, but these times begged for some courage. I want to bring that to Washington. And I don't want to be a politician. I want to be a representative. It's the most joyful part of this entire pursuit is driving around, meeting people like you every single day, uh, sharing a cup of coffee, hearing your stories, your histories, your dreams, your concerns, your ideas. Uh, and I will tell you, I've had a lot of joys in my life, but nothing, nothing that comes as close to the joy that I derive from doing this every single day. So uh, that's why I'm here. Not out of anger or fear, rather optimism, hopefulness, and most of all, responsibility. That's why I want to be your next congressman. So I will close with that uh, and let you know how grateful I am to all of you. Uh, I would rather you ask me questions and we'll get into policy that way. I definitely want to talk about campaign finance reform uh, and anything else uh, that may be on your mind. So without further ado, I turn it over to all of you. And I've never used that one before. I think I might use that <laughs> So how about some conversation? Yes. What's your position on guns? My position on guns. Uh, I believe we have a gun violence epidemic in this country. Uh, I don't talk about guns or gun control. I talk about gun violence. That is the problem. And it is an epidemic, and it is a crisis. Uh, it is, I am, I've only been at this for five months, and I'm sick and tired of issuing thoughts and prayers. I'm sick and tired because I have never felt so powerless as a member of a society to simply issue thoughts and prayers and not be in a position to do anything distinctly about it, which is another reason I'm running for Congress. Then you will ask, so what would I do if I were a member of Congress? And I would argue that the only, right now, I would absolutely implement a comprehensive background check policy. I think it's, it, it, a universal background check is an imperative in my estimation. But I also under, we do have a right to bear arms in this country. It is constitutional. That is not ambiguous. And that same amendment also said that we need a well-regulated militia, which clearly states that the founding, the, you know, those who constructed our Constitution um, anticipated the need to regulate uh, the arms. So what would I do? I would do what we've always done in this country when we have, when, when we have a safety issue a national health crisis. Same thing that we did back in the 60s and 70s when traffic fatalities were skyrocketing. So what do we do? We invested federal dollars in research to identify what could be done to prevent the tens of thousands of deaths that were occurring on our roads every year. We ended up redesigning how highways are designed and constructed. We redesigned, we, we designed, we had new standards that we afforded to the automobile industry to make cars more safe. 
safety belts, airbags. Now, also, we all know what it takes to even become a driver. You have to be a certain age. You have to go to classes. You have to pass a test. You can only have so many people in your car at certain times. You have to buy insurance on your automobile. Right? You have to have it registered. You can only drive a certain speed limit. And we all agree these are necessities to prevent people from dying unnecessarily on the roads. And what have we done? We have significantly reduced the fatalities per capita in dramatic ways. And we did so in a bipartisan, thoughtful fashion that was led by science. And I do. I happen to believe in science, uh, like I'm sure most of you in the room do as well. So what is my prescription for the gun violence epidemic? Uh, it's not to eliminate guns. It's not to eliminate guns. It is to study what is at the root of this madness and, and, and identify what steps we can take as a society to make it safer for everybody. Um, you know, I own a gun. And my friends who own guns recognize the same issue as at hand here. I don't want to be afraid to go to a concert or to go to my synagogue or church or mosque, whatever it is. Why should we live in fear like that? So that's what I would do. I would investigate this. I wouldn't, in fact, other than a universal background check at this point, I would research the issue in a thoughtful, methodical way, in a bipartisan way, invest the dollars we need to to identify how we can prevent this madness, and then come up with policy to address it. But the NRA, the NRA, which started out as a very thoughtful organization decades ago, has transitioned into, in my estimation, um, one of the greatest challenges this country faces. Because when you stand in the way of any thoughtful reformations on safety, this is about safety. This isn't about taking guns away, it's about safety. They have to be addressed, which is one other reason why I'm not taking money from political action committees and special interests. I'm not going to be beholden to the NRA or to any other organization for that matter. Unfortunately, again, 529 members of Congress can't say that out of the 535. So that's what I think we need to do. The NRA has fought for years to prevent dollars from being allocated to study this issue, which is ridiculous. So I would ask all of you to consider asking your representative or representatives to advocate for that. And by the way, that isn't legislation. That's just investigation, which is what we do in this country. It's the same way we do when we want to save lives by, by eliminating cancer and disease and eliminating traffic fatalities. So that's how I look at it this issue. Uh, and I will close with saying that um, this is happening every, every week, my friends. And uh, this is a country that should be better than simply issuing thoughts and prayers. And it is a dereliction of duty for every single member of Congress who does that and nothing else. Yes, sir. Eric Paulson has a lot of money, and he's running ads right now over a year ahead of the election. How do you plan on getting your voice heard? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so Eric Paulson, as far as I know, is not running ads himself. He has um, um, independent expenditure committees who support him running those ads. The CLF, the Congressional, Congressional Leadership Fund, I believe, is one, uh, and there are some others, um, which is fairly unusual to be running ads this far in advance of, of an election. Uh, and when you've been a career politician, as Eric Paulson has, uh, he's been at this for 30 years. He has built up a lot of name recognition. Uh, and as we say in marketing, a lot of brand equity. Uh, frankly, I think a lot of that equity is, uh, um, is untrue equity, but it's equity. People know the name. So yes, there is a hurdle, a big hurdle, that any of us who are seeking the DFL endorsement will have. Uh, but we have a wonderful plan. I started this race, I entered this race uh, some months ago. We have a year to go. Uh, I spend every single day, every waking hour that is free to me, traveling around doing this, meeting people, and building, um, building a family, building a family of people with whom I've met and visited uh, that I wish to represent. And my desire is doing this in the old-fashioned way and some new-fashioned ways. The old-fashioned way is meeting with people like you. Um, if we share principles and we share values, um, you might tell a friend or a relative or a loved one uh, and advocate on my behalf, which is what I need. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and this is the sad truth, uh, this race will probably be a $25 million, give or take, affair between the two parties, the candidates, which is an astounding amount of money, particularly because it will be repeated 
two years again. And uh, so raising money is an imperative. And any candidate who is going to take on Eric Paulson is going to have to raise many, many millions of dollars. It's just the truth. Uh, because you need a staff, and you need to articulate who you are. You need to introduce yourself. Because in this day and age, people lead busy, busy, busy lives, and television is one way to reach people, but that's not enough. You have to have a comprehensive strategy to win an election these days. Uh, but the, the saddest part of this is that no matter how much money the candidates raise, that includes Eric Paulson, should he be the Republican endorsed candidate again, uh, and the Democratic endorsed candidate, the money we raise is one thing, but behind that money is the dark money. And all the independent IE, we call it IE money, independent expenditure money, that comes from places all around the country, not often transparent, uh, and it's like bombs. It allows candidates in this day and age to portray their very best, finest selves. Wonderful men, wonderful women, kind, thoughtful, endearing, friendly. Because the candidates know that behind them, all the dark money is going to be bombarding their op opponents with terribly negative, mean-spirited advertising. So at the, in this day and age, there's no transparency or accountability anymore. You really don't know who you're electing. Because everybody wipes their hands of all the bad stuff, because <laughs> others are doing that. Um, so this will be a really difficult challenge. But uh, my experience in business uh, has always led me down paths where we were the lesser funded, if you will, of the competitors in, a, in the industry, uh, which means we had to be scrappy, and we had to out-hustle and out-work. And I'm taking the same approach in this campaign. I will not be out-hustled. I will not be out-worked. Uh, I will not be out-innovated. And we're going to be doing things in this campaign that are novel, exciting, fun, engaging. Uh, and welcoming, not just to Democrats, to everybody. And if we're going to win, when I say we, as a Democrat, if a Democrat is going to win this race, uh, he, well, I would say he, because uh, Alicia Donahue dropped out, but there are, so there are three now seeking the endorsement, uh, he has to invite, he has to invite thoughtful, moderate Republicans uh, to vote for him. Um, that's a truth in this district. And we need to uh, organize and invite and welcome and converse with thousands and thousands of people, which we will do. So without divulging our strategy, because we have an outstanding one uh, that we're already executing, um, uh, we have a very robust strategy and a wonderful chance to take this seat for the very first time since 1960, rest assured. I did not enter this race. Thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by tough challenges, and this is a tough challenge, but I have never entered anything in my life that I didn't know stood a chance of succeeding. And I'm relentless, and I'm optimistic, uh, and I'm thrilled, and I am rip-raring and ready to go. And scrappy. And scrappy. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. What can we do, and what will you be doing to get more young people excited So, uh, wonderful question. Uh, young people are going to be key to success. Um, and not just those who are old enough to vote. You know, there will be, be a lot of young people who are voting for the first time in this next election. Uh, but there's something quite extraordinary when you look at the possibility of engaging young people because uh, they are extraordinarily connected on social media. Their reach is so expansive, not just locally, but nationally. Um, I've already convened an extraordinary group of young people, both high school age and college age, to actually do policy research on my behalf, on our behalf as a campaign. And I've been more impressed with what they've presented than what a lot of very professional consultants have presented. They look at world issues in a, in, through a lens that is very compelling, um, very dynamic, and, and very helpful. I also recognize that young people uh, who join this initiative go home and have dinner with their parents at the dinner table. Uh, and they speak to their grandparents. And that is, in some respect, a very, a very elementary form of viral marketing. Uh, and we have a very robust strategy to engage young people throughout the district uh, to join this team. Uh, and we have uh, a whole long list of them already ready to go for next year. Uh, young people are more engaged than ever before in history. And I will tell you one other thing about young people. 
as i listen to what policy issues are important to people in this district what do you think the one that is most often referred to by high school students climate climate change you know and it's not surprising because i hear time and time again from teenagers say nothing else all of you are talking about matters if there's no nowhere left to live you know and, and if we if, if if we ruin if we ruin the environment uh, and the earth and you leave us nothing does, do taxes matter do guns matter no no does health care matter so it has inspired me to recognize that again as a father of two teenage daughters that uh, one of our foremost pri foremost priorities uh, is to ensure that the place we leave them is as clean and safe um, as as the one that we inherited and i'm afraid that we can't say that right now uh, climate change is real um, i believe in science uh, as i've said before and i see this as not just a need and an i see this as an opportunity it's an opportunity also an economic opportunity to make this um, a national calling the same way that john kennedy called for us to go to the moon and it took us nine years we should make that same thing our focus for the next generation and what an opportunity for a leader of this country regardless of party to bring the country together under a singular banner and pursuit that would create millions of jobs and do what many say could never have been done and that is to leave this place better than we found it. Um, it's possible, we already have the technology, we simply need the incentives and the investment to expand it. Uh, and that's the truth. And I'll tell you the most wonderful thing I've discovered so far is that conservation and climate change and environment are just as important to the Republicans in the district as they are to the Democrats. It is a unifying issue. This is not a divisive issue, it's a unifying. And it's a truth. And uh, kids, of both political persuasions that I speak to, identify this as number one in most cases. So um, this goes back to your ultimate question, which was how are we gonna engage young people? Uh, we're gonna engage them in a big way, and I've already learned from them, uh, and they will be a big part of this campaign. Yes? To go back just for a second to the um, campaign finance reform, mm -hmm. when you're elected, Thank you. I hope you will go even further. I would like, I think that there's too much money spent mm -hmm. When there's so many things that we need sure. done, I mean, I don't know, it lasts way too long, they spend way too much money. I don't even like to give anymore because I think it's just going towards yeah. TV ads and I would rather just give to a candidate, but mm -hmm. it needs to be totally reformed. Yeah. And like maybe Billions. where they give, the government gives every candidate so much money and they have televised debates and they have things on Facebook and things in the newspaper, because not everybody reads you know, right here, we don't all get our information the same way. It's true. But it's a waste of money. I agree. Billions of dollars spent in the last yeah. federal election. And, and people um, are hungry. And there are some very thoughtful ways. You know, I, I'm starting to look uh, at best practices, uh, campaign finance best practices. Richard Painter, a wonderful, prominent Republican whose name you all probably know now because he uh, was an ethics uh, uh, counsel in the, in the George Bush White House. Uh, he wrote a book on campaign finance reform, making the conservative case for campaign finance reform. Uh, I met with him recently. He's a wonderful man with great ideas, uh, inspired me. Um, you know, his proposition and prescription is using a federal tax credit, a $200 federal tax credit, that every single American who pays taxes would be afforded to designate to uh, candidates of their choice, which would have a really remarkable effect because it would now re-enfranchise the people who feel so disenfranchised right now. Um, and that's an, that's an imperative. Let's get people part of the process. If you have to direct your contribution to somebody by definition that you're engaged, you're participating. So that's his notion, and he's a conservative. And I think there's some really wonderful possibilities in that area. Uh, a lot of democracies around the world cap expenditures, which are out of control. You know, the, the special election in Georgia that happened earlier this year was a $50 million affair. And you know how little of that money came from Georgia? Do any of you want to be subject to people in California or New York or Texas or Florida who are influencing this campaign? It's almost like Russia. Does it, <laughs> I, you know, that you, you, I think you can conflate these things. You know? Interests that aren't reflected here, by definition, are outside interests. So I'm troubled by that like you are. There are a lot of ways we can fix this. And you know, on, on one end of the scale would be a constitutional amendment. 
And by the way, this shouldn't be a conservative or a liberal issue or a Republican or Democratic issue. This should be just an American issue. What's in the best interest of our democracy? Um, so whether it's capping expenditures, um, whether it's reducing the amount that individuals can share with campaigns, uh, whether it's requiring that if you invest in a campaign, if you make a contribution to a candidate, it has to be a candidate for whom you can actually vote. Imagine that novel idea, <laughs> right? So if it's a presidential election, it can be anybody in the country send a check in. You know, if it's a if it's a Senate election, anybody in the state of Minnesota. But if it's a if it's a, a U.S. House of Representatives election, maybe we should think about that. Maybe the only people that should be able to afford resources to the candidates in that race are ones that actually live in the district. You know, how novel would that be? And maybe we should look at having a national voting day. We've got a lot of national holidays. Why don't we elevate the day that, in my estimation, is probably the single most important day of the year in a democracy, a thriving democracy, set it aside so that parents and grandparents can bring their kids and grandkids to the voting booth and express to them why civic engagement is important. Uh, these are not crazy ideas. And I don't have the full prescription. I've got a 10-point plan that I want people to at least look at and consider. I'm hearing some wonderful ideas from Republicans, wonderful ideas from Democrats, and everybody in between. And I'd love your ideas, too. But this issue, I promise, because I'm not, I'm not a candidate who's going to promise to fix everything when I get to Washington. I don't have a magic wand. That first date? <laughs> first date, <laughs> like other politicians have. Yeah. I want, like I said, I want to be a representative. And I want you all to remember that we have a system, a wonderful democratic system, that is designed to prevent change from happening easily. That's why we are so lucky. And that is why we are so lucky right now with the man who inhabits the White House. So I want to make that promise to you. I will elevate campaign finance reform as one of the most important issues that needs to be addressed before anything else. Because without me, who? Nobody is doing it. And that is, a, that is the one promise that I can absolutely keep and I insist that you help me, I beg of you, to help me elevate. Because without doing so, I, it will be a lonely voice. I will be relentless, but it will be a lonely voice. And I need you. Yeah, Ty. Um, would you be in favor or not in favor of redoing the inter-party delegate system, super delegate system? Oh. You know, the electoral system. You're, you're, talk, you're talking about actually for the. You're talking about a, a, for the Democratic Party. Yeah, because there yeah. might be a lot of young people that are disenfranchised. Yeah. Or yeah. Issue. I'll tell you. I have you know, I have problems. I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed to say, uh, with both how we select candidates uh, uh, as a state in, a, in our state um, system, uh, and also the national system. Uh, I, I'm troubled by that. Anything that disenfranchises people and allows the few to make decisions for the many troubles me. So I share with you my principles on this subject. 